Well, it's not a passage that you would choose to celebrate a birthday this morning's gospel. The 33rd Sunday of the year is what I've always called the end of the year gospel before we celebrate the final Sunday, which is the feast of Christ the King next Sunday. So I would like you with me to imagine the disciples having heard our Lord's words, walking home and having this discussion. And you can hear them say, was he talking about Jerusalem being destroyed? Or was he talking about something else? I'm not sure. When is this, all of this supposed to happen? Well, didn't you hear him? He said, nobody knows except the Father. And why bring up the fig tree? Maybe he was telling us that out of all of these things are out of our hands and that out of our control, like a tree sprouting leaves, you can't do much about it, can you? And then one of the disciples says this, but you know what I liked? I liked it when he said, the world will pass away, but my words will not pass away. In other words, no matter what happens, I'm in control of things. So over the centuries, we've learned that when it comes to the end, it serves no purpose to start stacking canned goods in the cellar or to check out where the life preservers are piled up. We've been thinking about the fig tree for 2,000 years, as we should, but it seems to me, and we know that we're in it for the long haul. Emphasis on long, not haul. And if that's true, for 2,000 years now, we've been considering that fig tree. If that's true, I've got to pay a lot of attention, of attention to what I carry in my life. And here I'm supposing that the stars aren't going to fall out of the sky the minute I buy a winning lottery ticket. The end is God's business, my friends. How I live life right now, walk along the road of life, is my business according to God's grace, of course. So what keeps us going on the long haul? What has kept us going for 2,000 years saying, he's coming? 2,000 years we've been saying that. He's going to come, and yet we continue walking with great piety and faith for 2,000 years. The most important things, then, on this Sunday deserve our attention, and I'd like to single one out. What has kept us together and what keeps us together over the centuries, I think, is forgiveness. Imagine a church and imagine a world where there is no room for forgiveness. We take that for granted. This businessman says, I went to a meeting recently, and for most of it, I felt warm and friendly toward my colleagues. And I was positive about all that was happening. I was in good spirits. I was generous, looking for places to help. And then shortly before the meeting ended, one of my colleagues made a biting comment about me that struck me as very bitter and unfair. And immediately, a series of those doors began to close inside me. My warmth disappeared. And it turned into hardness and anger. In a minute, my warmth turned into anger. And I struggled not to obsess about that incident. And the feelings didn't pass away quickly. Coldness and paranoia lingered inside of me, and I wanted to avoid any contact with that man who made those negative comments about me. I stewed in my negativity. Can't live like that, my friends. You can't live life stewing. And I mention it because that forgiveness in memory of the eternal covenant for the forgiveness of sins, do this in memory of me. The entire person of Jesus Christ is centered upon forgiveness. And we have buried it deep inside of us. But that's the sort of stuff that gets awfully heavy, this resentment, this stewing, because we all know the story. 
We've all been wounded. Nobody grows with his or her heart fully intact. And it doesn't take much to shake up that heart. And so much of our lightness or heaviness of heart is dictated by the amount of forgiveness or unforgiveness that we let into our lives. It's absolute. The early church fathers said that we are made up of two minds and two hearts in their great wisdom, that we have a big heart and a big mind. We have the saint inside of us. We are created in the image of God, and that image of God is warm and kind. And then on the other side, there is inside of us a petty heart and a petty mind, the wounded part that turns us to self-protection, closes doors, and builds walls. Why do we need this forgiveness business? I'll tell you. It's because we're complicated. And the only thing that saves us from ourselves is our God. We have big hearts and petty ones. We have open minds and we have minds of prejudice. We are trusting and, oh, we are suspicious. We are saintly and we are selfish. We are generous and we are cold, which describes our society and our nation right now. Everything depends upon which heart and mind we are linked to at any given time. Funny, in one minute we're willing to die for somebody, and the next minute we could care less. One minute we want to give ourselves totally, and the next minute we lash out. And what makes life so very bearable is forgiveness. That said, what we do is we journey on life, but we have one another. And that has always been the strength of the church. We have each other to hold on to, the body of Christ. And I'm not talking about a civic society here. I'm not talking about being citizens. I'm talking about being sons and daughters of God, brothers and sisters of God, and that is what holds us together as we hold on to one another. And that's why the church insists that if we do not stay close to one another, then the Lord, it's very difficult to see the Lord in our lives. We hold on to each other, and that has been the secret of the church, my friends. We hold on to each other no matter what happens. And if we should stop forgiving one another, then that weakens the body of Christ. A story from an old woman. I can say old because she was 97. And she tells this story about when she was a young girl. And the newspaper headlines, and this, this goes back a while back. She, she had no idea when she was growing up of airplanes or televisions or automobiles. Russia had a czar, China had an emperor, and the only way to get to Europe was by boat. So she tells this story. Her short-term memory, not so good, but her long-term memory got better, and she tells, you'll never forget the story of that summer's day in her childhood when she and a bunch of girls decided to climb Mount Washington. And they went too far and stayed too long and before they knew it, the beautiful sunset had turned into a foggy dusk. Now, I want to put parentheses here. I want you to know that that happened to me on Mount Kearsage a few years back. That's why I hit the story. No one had a flashlight in those days. Flashlights weren't invented. No one knew for sure which way was down, but they agreed, those young girls, to hold each other's hands and that they would not let go of one another. That's how they did it. One girl up front picking her way down the mountain, one step at a time, and all the rest strung behind her, holding on to each other's wrists so that they might have a living human chain. And every now and then someone would argue about which way to go, others would listen, but none of them ever let go. And sometimes, she said, all I knew and could see of the world was the hand in front of me and the hand behind me. 
and sometimes my arms hurt so badly I wanted to cry out loud, but we made it at last. We found our way home by holding on to each other. And that, my friends, is how we will find our way home. I find that story to be a beautiful definition of what church is. We cannot let go of the hands in front of us or the hands behind us. And that's not a pious sentiment. No matter what we go through as a church, no matter what we go through personally, we've always got to keep in mind that there's a hand in front of us and a hand in back of us and that Jesus Christ has placed those hands there for us. So, to summarize, don't you love the word summarize? <laughs> uh, we've got enough to do being saints. We've got enough to do living right now and not worrying about what is God's business or whether or not the fig tree will blossom. But I can assure you, my friends, when the end comes, when it comes to the end, everything will be fine. And if it's not fine, it won't be the end.